Hello everyone, this is Mike Howard and I am here with Beth Howard and we're going to do a Bible study. <laughs> Welcome to the next quarter of the Explore the Bible book series. Da, 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 da. We're going to spend 13 weeks in the book of Ezekiel and Daniel, mm. the two books of the major prophets. Mm -hmm. Today is lesson number one of Ezekiel and it's in Ezekiel verses, uh, chapter 3 verses 8 through 21. The title of the lesson is Commissioned. It's when God commissions Ezekiel to be his prophet. It's an interesting set of verses, so you're going to uh, really enjoy it. But uh, when I was studying for the lesson, I came across an interesting quote because you don't find many sermons uh, from the books of uh, the prophets. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the articles I read uh, had this quote. It says, the prophets aren't feel-good books. Uh -oh nor do they seem to contain the kind of practical news that you can use that is found in the epistles and the wisdom literature like uh, Psalms and Proverbs. And if you're just looking for a good story like Noah or uh, uh, maybe David and Goliath, uh, they are really very, the stories that you'll find in the prophets are sometimes very confusing because it's talking about a lot of imagery and future, uh, future things that are going to happen uh, to, at the end of uh, the end times. So uh, why do we need to study these Old Testament prophets? And well, there are a lot of reasons. Uh, I've listed four. Jerusalem represented a shadow of God's physical kingdom because we know that when the new Jerusalem comes down from heaven, that that will be the place where we live with Jesus forever. So the current physical kingdom of Jerusalem or city of Jerusalem represents the new future. Uh, it's the shadow of the new kingdom of, of, uh, of God. And then the temple within Jerusalem represents God's dwelling with his people. So God dwelled in the temple in the Holy of Holies, uh, and that was a shadow of him dwelling with us in the new Jerusalem. The exile that we're going to take a look at today, that represents our condition of rebellion when we were without Christ. So people who are, are not Christians, who don't believe in Jesus, they live in a, a state of rebellion. That's the way the Bible presents them. And they live in a place called the world, which is represented by Babylon, and also it has been represented by the nation of um, Egypt. So uh, the prophets, the books that we'll take a look at, all in, now the encouraging part for us as Christians is we were not part of the old covenant. So that was the covenant that God had with Israel, okay? But when Christ came and that covenant was renewed or made new in the New uh, Testament, and we now are permitted as Gentiles to become part of that uh, covenant relationship with God. And we, the, the old nation Israel and the new a covenant have combined the Gentiles and the Jews into something called the church. And so once these prophets get going with their prophesying, they soon get into the part about where Israel is redeemed. And that includes us. That, they're talking now about not just the nation Israel, but they're talking about the church. So the prophets all end with God's people being gloriously and permanently that's restored to a relationship. That is feel good and happy. Okay, so that's another reason that we uh, are encouraged to study these prophets. So you can break the Bible into some major chunks or sections. The law, which is the first five books of the Bible, like Genesis and Exodus, Leviticus and uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy. Uh, that was, those were five books written by Moses. And then there are the historical books, uh, First and Second Kings, um, uh, First and Second Samuel, <clears throat> uh, uh, Chronicles, uh, even uh, Joshua. And so those are the books that are historical. They just chronicle the history of the nation of Israel. Then there are the poetic books. We've studied several of those. Psalms, uh, Proverbs, uh, Job, for example, uh, and, and then uh, Ecclesiastes we just finished a few months ago. And then we get to the section called the prophetic books, and that's the rest of our uh, Old Testament. Uh, now, the Jewish uh, Bible, uh, they get sprinkled in different places. But for us, we see 17 books in the prophetic books. Five of those, the first five, are called the major prophets. 
And that doesn't mean that they were like better than the minor prophets. It just <laughs> means that, language. yes, right. That just means that the books were longer than most of them were longer than. And then there are 12, quote, minor prophets, but all 17 books are, are the prophetic books. And then, of course, you get into the New Testament. We have the Gospels and then the letters from Peter, James, John, and, uh, and Paul. So in the prophetic books, the major prophet books, there are really four authors or four prophets. There's Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Uh, Jeremiah also wrote another book called a major prophet book. It's a little shorter. It's called Lamentations. And it's really a book about how Jerusalem feels once the nation of Israel is removed. It's a it's, it's very sad uh, book. Laments. It's a lament. Yeah, it's a sad lament. It's kind of a, it's written as a funeral, kind of a funeral poem uh, for that. So we're going to get a chance in the next 13 weeks to probe into two of the four major prophets that were chosen by God to talk to the nation, not just Israel, but the what's remaining of Israel at this point called Judah. So let me take you through a brief history of that. Uh, the kingdom of Israel was united as one under the King David, under King David and then King Solomon. But once Solomon's son became king, the northern kingdom broke off and became the northern kingdom versus Judah. And so once that happened, they had their own capital and they had their own priests and the whole, whole nine yards. They're just separate nation. Now, this chart is a timeline. It's a little on the confusing side, but at the top of the timeline, you see uh, years in before Christ. So 950 BC, all the way up to 400 BC. And the part that I've got in the red box is the part of the, of the calendar or of the timeline that represents the exile. The first exile was the Northern Kingdom. They were taken off in about six, 750. They were taken away from the, their territory by the nation of Assyria. Over 110 years later, the Southern Kingdom, Judah, was taken into exile by Nebuchadnezzar uh, into Babylon. Okay, and that didn't happen all at once. It happened in actually four waves. So there were four different waves of people being taken out of Judah or Jerusalem into exile. And the prophets, as you can see here, the major prophets that were preaching to the exiles were Isaiah and then Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel. So the, the, the five major prophetic, pro prophetic books, easy for me to say, uh, come while Judah is in exile, okay? And you can see the remaining minor prophets here were kind of scattered a little before the exile and also uh, like Malachi was after they returned or post-exile. That's a good chart. Yeah, and you'll find this at the, at the back of your quarterly on the inside cover, there's this wonderful chart that shows you the path that the Nebuchadnezzar used to take the exiles out of uh, Jerusalem and Judea uh, into the uh, just south of the city of Babylon, right uh, next to a river. So the period of exile for Judah, it lasted 70 years. For the northern kingdom, it was permanent. There were nine tribes in the northern kingdom and they are dispersed and they are, they're gone. Uh, we just don't know where they are. They're the lost tribes. So the northern kingdom, all nine tribes were exiled into or by Assyria and they have dispersed and that happened in 721 BC. The first wave of these four waves of the Judean exiles happened in 608 BC. And that's where uh, Nebuchadnezzar came in and took the king and the, uh, the, the top soldiers, the, the top royalty, uh, all of the, the, the elite people and took them back. You remember the story of Daniel and his friends? Well, they were part of the first wave of the exile. And then uh, there was uh, another wave and then a third wave. And that was when uh, Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed in the third wave. So the, uh, but the second wave was when Ezekiel was actually taken into exile. So he was a part of the second wave. And then the final remaining uh, wave of exile was in 582. And then only 50 years later, less than 50 years later, <coughs> Judah actually returned from Babylon because Persia conquered Babylon and Cyrus was very friendly towards the Jews and he let them come back into Jerusalem. So that's a long-winded history of what happened. Good but, for but, but good for Cyrus. Yeah. <laughs> but Ezekiel was God's prophet during from the second wave all the way through 
uh, to the last wave of these exiles. And his job was to warn the exiles about the future uh, uh, impending doom of not only the city of Jerusalem, but also uh, the loss of the temple. Uh, and God actually leaves the nation of Israel at that point when the temple is destroyed. So let's get started on today's specific lesson. That is how God actually commissioned Ezekiel to be his prophet. And it's going to start in verse 8 and end in 21. But we have to get started a little earlier than that, as usual. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 4, because God actually sees, or actually, Ezekiel actually sees God coming, and it's pretty cool. He says, I looked and I saw a windstorm. It reminds me of how uh, God came uh, to Job. I saw a windstorm coming out of the north, an immense cloud with flashing lightning, lightning and surrounded by brilliant light. The center of the fire looked like glowing metal. Wow. So this was a big deal. And then in chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, uh, God says to, uh, uh, to Ezekiel, this is, this is how God begins the process of telling Ezekiel that he's commissioning him. He says, he calls him not Ezekiel. He calls him a new term, a term that, that we've never, we haven't heard before up to this point in the Bible. He says, you are son of man. I am sending you to the Israelites. They are a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. Okay, let me pause just a second there. Jesus actually, now you wonder, how did Jesus, what did Jesus think about the books uh, in the major prophets area? And we know that he quoted from not only Ezekiel, but I think his favorite book to quote from was Isaiah, quoted from Isaiah a bunch of times. So uh, Jesus actually loved the books of the prophets, okay? And, and he actually reached into Ezekiel and chose this as his favorite term for himself, himself okay? Yeah. So he identifies, clearly he identifies with Ezekiel. So let's begin to look for how Jesus might see himself with this job description. Son of man, he says, I'm sending you to the Israelites to a rebellious nation. Did Jesus find them, especially the leadership, to be a rebellious nation? You bet he did. He says they rebelled against me, and they and their ancestors, not just the current generation, but all of, always they've been rebellious. They've been in revolt against me until this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn, and I want you to say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Okay, now we're going to go verses 5 and 7. I'm going to skip verse 6 and then I'll come back to it. He says, now, this is pretty cool. He says, God is saying this to Ezekiel, who's probably taking copious notes. He says, whether they listen, I'm sending you to this obstinate, stubborn, stiff-necked people who don't want to hear this message. He says, whether they listen or they fail to listen, for they are a rebellious people, you must, verse 7, you must speak my words to them, whether they listen or or they fail to listen, for they are rebellious. So you, you see bookends here. There's a bookend uh, called verse 5 and a bookend called verse 7. He says, whether they listen or they fail to listen, you got to talk to them, okay? Can't they are rebellious. You can't give up. Yeah. So let's see what the, what's in the middle of the bookend. Son of man, I don't want you to be afraid of them or what they say to you. Just don't be afraid, even though you're going to be facing briars and thorns and they're going to look like scorpions to you. They're going to sting you. They're going to beat you. They're going to abuse you. They're going to stone you. They're going to try to kill you. He says, in spite of all that, I don't want you to be afraid of what they say or be terrified of them because, once again, they are a rebellious people. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm sitting for a job interview and I said, hey, could you explain a little bit to me about the job? And this was the first part of the job description that you got through telling me, I would be looking for the closest exit. Excuse me, I got to go to the bathroom. I'll be back in a little while. Mm -hmm. So let's get started with uh, the next part of the conversation. Now, God and Ezekiel are still having this first conversation where he's being commissioned. He says, uh, I'm telling you, don't be afraid. And the reason I'm telling you not to be afraid is because I actually am going to be with you. I am going to strengthen you. I am going to give you what you need to stand up to this rebellious, obstinate generation of people. He says, I, he says the way I'm going to do that is I'm going to make you as unyielding as, and as hardened as they are. In other words, 
You are not going to be like a sheep among wolves. I am actually going to give you the strength of the lion of Judah. I am going to make you strong. And Jesus was. Jesus stood toe to toe with them, face to face, nose to nose. And, and he really told them the truth, the, them being the leadership. He says, I'm going to make you as unyielding, as hardened as they are. I'll make your forehead like the hardest stone, harder than flint. Do not be afraid of them or terrified by them. Now, you can see Jesus reading Ezekiel as he's growing up. He's a little boy growing up and his eyes are probably this big going, whoa, that sounds like a difficult job. But the good news is my father is going to prepare me for this task. Don't be terrified of them for they are a, guess what? They are rebellious people as if he needed to be reminded again. And then he said, your job, here's, it's not a complicated job. Your job has three components. First component, he said to me, son of man, listen to what I say carefully. Part two, not only listen to it up here, I want you to take it to heart. I want you to understand the meaning, not just the letter of the law. I want you to understand the intent. In other words, I'm going to tell you the words to say, and I want you to hear those words, but I also want you to understand what I mean by those words. So I want you to take them to heart. All the words that I speak to you, part one, listen to them. Part two, comprehend what they mean, okay? And this speaks to us because we have a job to do as the church today. It's the same job that Jesus started. We've got the same job, and that is to tell people, the rebellious people, about Christ, okay? And First part of the job is we got to understand the gospel message, but the more important part of the job is we've got to live the gospel message. We've got to take it to our hearts. He says that part number three is then I want you to go tell them about the gospel message. So go now to your people in exile, and I want you to speak this message to them. Say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. This isn't just what Ezekiel says. This is what Mike says. This is what First Baptist of whatever says. This is what the Lord God says. And then he goes back and he says it again. He says, your job is to do those three things. Your job isn't to worry about how many views you get on YouTube or whether or not the pull, the, 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 the pews get full every Sunday morning. That's not your concern. Your concern is to literally give the message, hear the message, comprehend the message, and speak the message, whether they listen or fail to listen. And he's going to give us four cases. He says that, that a lot. He? he does say that a lot. He's going to give us four cases to make sure that he hammers home the importance of us communicating the message. But that, that actually concludes uh, Ezekiel's first meeting with God. And it's kind of cool because... Uh, the part that we'd left out was that when God shows up, he shows up with these cherubim and they're the four living creatures and they make all this noise with their wings. It sounds like if you've ever been to a really big waterfall, that's the way he describes it. It sounds like this giant rushing water. He says, then the spirit lifted me up and I heard behind me a loud rumbling sound as the glory of the Lord rose from the place where it was standing. And it was the sound of the wings of the living creatures brushing against each other and the sound of the wheels beside them, a loud rumbling sound. So God and his presence and his entourage of these four living creatures gets up and leaves the conversation and leaves. And then they transport, the spirit transports Ezekiel uh, to where the exiles are, are living. Wow, he just was there. He was there. He said, the spirit then lifted me up. The sweets, the, now he told him earlier on, and I left this part out, he told him, that he said, I want you to take this scroll. The scroll was uh, his words. He says, I want you to eat the scroll, meaning I want you to understand what I'm saying in the scroll. And the scroll was really difficult news, but it tasted good, meaning that Ezekiel understood it well, but then when it got to his stomach, it turned his stomach sour because the message was a distressing message. He said, the spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in anger ups my spirit with the strong hand of the Lord on me. I came to the exiles who lived at Tel Aviv near the Kibar River. That's just south of Babylon. And there, where they were living, I sat among them for seven days deeply distressed. And let me just say, why do you think he was sitting there deeply distressed? Well, he's got this message. He's eaten the scroll. He's heard the message. He knows what the message is going to be. He's comprehending it. And he knows 
the news is very, very serious news. I don't know if you've ever had to give a message to somebody that was very distressing or a message they did not want to hear. Uh, I think of doctors having to tell patients that they've got cancer. Uh, I had to give a message to, to employees sometimes that they, their performance was bad and that they were going to get laid off or fired. Uh, that was a message. That was not a message I wanted to give because I knew it wasn't a message they wanted to hear. It was distressing. It took its toll on me anytime mm. I had to do it. Giving a hard message is hard to do mm. because we don't want to hurt people's feelings. So here's Ezekiel, this poor priest. He's from the, the priestly order of Levi, and he thought he was going to grow up and be this priest. And now God's tapped him to not be a priest, but to be a prophet. So tough job, deeply distressed. And at the end of seven days, the word of the Lord came to me. So now God's going to say, okay, it's important for you to start this message. And he's going to give him four cases that he, to, he's really just emphasizing to him the importance of speaking these words. So case number one, he says, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the people of Israel. So I want you to hear the word I speak and I want you to give them this warning. And the word warning here means I want you to bring light to these people who are walking in darkness. Mm -hmm. He says, I want you to bring them the light of my word because they're walking in the darkness of their own understanding. That's basically what he's saying here. And he says, the importance of the job, Ezekiel, I want to make sure you understand the critical nature of this job of telling people this word. And that this is a great message to us about understanding the importance of, of living and being the gospel in our churches to a world around us that's lost and dying. And sometimes we feel like, well, you know, we don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, catch the, new, the following news here, because this is what he tells Ezekiel about uh, the importance of this job. Case example number one, when the wicked are not warned, in other words, you've got this message for the people who are going to die in their sin, and you don't tell them the message. When I say to a wicked person, you will surely die, and you, Ezekiel, don't warn them about that or speak out to dissuade them from their evil ways in order to save their life, that wicked person is going to die for their sin, but Ooh. Ezekiel... If you did not warn them, I'm going to hold you accountable for their blood. So the wicked people that you don't warn, when I tell you to warn them and you don't deliver that message, I'm going to hold you accountable for that. Case number two, when the wicked people are warned, but they choose not to repent. So the first case was you didn't warn them and they're going to die, but I'm going to hold it against you. Second case, you did warn them, but they didn't repent. That's the, going to be a whole different story. But if you do warn the wicked person and they do not turn from their wickedness or from their evil ways, then they are going to die for their sins, but you have saved yourself because you did what I asked you to do. You told the message. Case number three, if you find a righteous person, again, when a righteous person turns uh, turns from their righteousness and does evil. So you got, let's say it's a church member and you see that they're going off down the wrong road and you do not tell them. In other words, I put a stumbling, he says, I put a stumbling block before them. In other words, I am going to you put them in a situation where they are going to stumble over their sin. And he says, but since you did not warn them, you saw them drifting away. You saw them going away from God. You saw them since you didn't warn them, they're going to die for their sin. The righteous things that a person did, that's not going to be remembered. Now, this is pre-Christ, okay? So understand that. He says, then I'm going to hold you accountable for their blood. But if you do warn a righteous person, and what we can learn as Christians is when we see our brothers or sisters wandering off, this is important. We are called to be their accountability partner in this thing. If you do warn the righteous person not to sin and they don't sin, they surely will live because they took warning from you and you will have saved yourself. Cases one through four, what God is telling Ezekiel is this job, although it's difficult, is incredibly difficult important. As a matter of fact, it's life or death. Mm. So let me summarize. Prophet job description. Dear prophet, by the way, almost Jesus said you, 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 you killed the prophets and now you're, you pretend to make them heroes. He's talking to the leaders of his day. He says, he said, God says to the prophets, and this is why you would not want to raise your hand, okay? To deliver a message that the people don't want to hear. They're rebellious. They're stiff-necked. They're 
uh, what do they call them? They're all kinds of bad stuff. Oh, hard-hearted, hard rebellious. The pe to a people who are stiff-necked, hard-hearted, and rebellious. And that actually describes everybody, okay? Especially people who don't know Christ. And then they're going to threaten you. They're going to curse at you. They're going to abuse you. But I'm telling you, don't be afraid of that. I'm going to tell you ahead of time you're going to be persecuted. And because I'm telling you ahead of time, you're also going to know that I'm going to be with you. And I'm going to strengthen you. So don't look at this as a fearful job. I'm going to give you the strength to do it. But then he says at the end, he says, failure is going to result in their death. Andrew. And your death, Please. Ezekiel. That's your job description. So what's your reaction to that, Ezekiel? Gee, I can't wait. When do we get started? Sign me up. Now, Ezekiel, much like Isaiah, who said, uh, here am I, send me, um, they understood the importance of the job. And they understood the necessity of telling people that they needed to repent. So, hard job, you betcha. Being a normal soldier, nothing like it. Being a ranger, being a Navy SEAL, being special forces, that's a lot closer to being a prophet. Wow. It's tough, tough work. So what's our conclusion? We're sitting here on the other side of the cross, completely forgiven, totally righteous through Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ has saved us. We are restored to our relationship with God. How do we look at these Old Testament prophets warning these people to repent? And what do we take away from that? Ezekiel learned his job description. Deliver God's message of judgment and redemption. Most people aren't going to hear you. You're going to get persecuted. Don't be afraid. God's going to provide. And the job is life or death. Wow. That's what Ezekiel learned. Guess what? That's what? We get the same job. That's only right. we don't have the personal death threat hanging over us. Being a prophet was a tough job. People, nobody, none of my friends that aren't Christians, they don't want to hear about Jesus. Most of them will go, nope, don't talk to me about Jesus. Don't want to hear about it. That's not up to me. My job isn't whether they hear or they don't hear, whether they listen or they don't listen. Not my responsibility. That's the responsibility of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My job is to tell them the gospel. And to live it. And to live it. People oh. don't want to hear God's truth. God's truth, which is the gospel, isn't just an interesting story. It's not just an enticing theory. It's not just something that they might want to be introduced to. It's a life or death message eternally. And we, the church, have that responsibility. And much like Ezekiel, who goes and sits for seven days thinking about how serious this is, we need to spend time with the Lord letting that sink in. Mm. It is good news. The good news is Christ died for us. The good news is he rose again. We have eternal life with him. The bad news, if you don't hear that message, if you don't believe that message, it's not going to work for you. You're going to spend eternity separated from God, living in a place where there is no way to get the temperature down like it is here in Florida right now. So that's a sobering fact. What did Jesus see in Ezekiel? His favorite name for himself, for one, son of man. He identified with the role of prophet. He understood that that message was going to be not, those people were not going to want to hear it. He understood that a lot of people, most of Israel was going to reject it. He only spoke what God told him to say. You remember what he says? He says, your job, not complicated. Listen to what I'm saying, internalize it, comprehend it, and then speak, speak it, Okay. Jesus heard that loud and clear. He says in John chapter 12, verse 50, everything I say came straight from the Father. I haven't said anything of my own. I only say, only repeat what my Father says to me. And if people respond, they receive life. If they don't, then they're condemned. That's, you tell them anyway. You tell them anyway. Whether they listen or not. And Jesus did. Everywhere he went, and he told the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, he told them all. He says, I'm just, I'm just going to keep telling you. And for those of you who have ears to hear, Bless let you hear. Ooh, okay. Good. So John 12, 48, he says, 
This is the message of salvation that God has provided. Mm. Receive it and you have life. Reject it, you have death. Mm. Pray with me. Father God, thank you for the prophets of old. Thank you that they took on a really difficult job and they did it anyway because they had your message of life and death. Father, for, thank you for all that they've revealed to us and their messages to us. Thank you most of all that they show that in the end, we're going to be with you completely redeemed, forgiven, and renewed. And Father, that's a message that's not just for the nation of Israel. It's for the church. It's for all who believe in the redemption through Jesus Christ. Father, it's a serious message, and it's important for us as a church to take it seriously. It's a hard message to hear. It's important for us to understand that we're not to be afraid that God, your Holy Spirit is going to give us the boldness. Your Holy Spirit is going to give us the wisdom and the strength to communicate that message. So Father, if I get nothing else from this lesson, let me understand that it's critically important for us to communicate the message of life in Jesus Christ. Mm. Amen. It's powerful. It is powerful. Join us uh, next week for lesson number two. We will skip the Christmas lesson uh, and go in and teach a Christmas lesson for that. So five more lessons for Ezekiel, and then we'll do six lessons for Daniel. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a great study. Until then, stay healthy and stay safe. Take care. Bye. Bye, y'all.